Good evening, all. I'm Karan Kalra on behalf of ADVI, presenting Women's Health and Fertility Division as a business unit head. We welcome today the moderators, speakers, panelists, and our respected delegates for joining us. A special thanks to the founder and the co-founders of IHERA, Dr. Ved Prakash, Dr. Charujit Joshi, Dr. Sanjay Shukla. Going forward, we have the coordinators, the people behind running the show. First of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Akash Agrawal, the scientific director at Hegde Fertility, Hyderabad. Ms. Yoshita Tanwar, embryologist at New Life India Clinic, New Delhi. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Nidhi Singh, embryologist at IVF and Reproductive Biology Center, MAMC, and at NJP Delhi. Without much ado, I forward it handed over to Dr. Akash Agrawal. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we, uh, today we have joined. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we are going to have a wonderful session uh, next couple of hours. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Charuva Joshi, sir. He is an MSc, uh, PhD from Belgium. He is a postgraduate in life sciences. Uh, he has uh, trained in uh, from Gang, Belgium, and from KK Sumin Hospital, Singapore, and assisted hatching from Belgium and PGD from Germany. He has held uh, multiple uh, positions as executive committee member in MPSR chapter, MPIFS chapter. Uh, he has uh, we have the honor of having the past uh, vice president and president from ACE. Uh, sir, over to you. So welcome this. On behalf of IRA, I welcome you all to this fantastic event where uh, we are going to learn about uh, this andrology. This is very important um, subject in today's uh, scene. And uh, I feel that andrology is uh, one of the neglected uh, part till now because as far as overall infertility concerned, it's mostly related with the female part. So. Uh, Let's begin with this uh, webinar on uh, our andrology. So we have, uh, can we start with the first uh, lectures? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I would like to call on uh, Dr. Manisha Bajpai. She would be the moderator for our first talk being presented by Dr. Krishna Chaitanya. Uh, Dr. Manisha Bajpai is a director in scientific research and embryology at Pacific Medical College, Udaipur. Uh, in the past, she has held uh, the post of scientist at uh, the reputed Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Her areas of interest are PGD, PGS, and metagenomics in reproductive medicine. Uh, she has uh, been uh, the principal investigator for multiple ongoing research projects, uh, including one from the government of Rajasthan. And uh, she has 15 chapters in books and international publications. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Akash, for your kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, uh, I must congratulate uh, uh, Team IHERA Academy uh, for organizing this wonderful series of webinars, encompassing all the aspects of embryology, starting from the basics, then routine practices, now in the advances in field of embryology, which is being considered as a, a few years back, it was considered as a field of uh, passive medicine with the limited protocols and um, practices. But now time has changed. It is a quite promising time for the embryology with the advent of new tools and techniques. But being a lab person, we all know in a heart in heart that how apprehensive we feel before implementing any new technology in our lab. Um, and at this juncture, the discussions with peers, with the experts and uh, real time data, their experiences helped us enormously in bringing uh, in those technology, adapting our uh, adapting those technology to our lab conditions. For example, semen analysis or selection of the best sperm is something very basic and which is being done in each and every IVF lab. And uh, till now, the robust parameter for this analysis used to be the mortality, morphology, vitality, and the concentration. But we all know that we wanted to offer something beyond that something which can make our selection more robust, more specific, which, something which can increase our success rate. Microfluidic seems to be a promising technique, but again, um, there are few things, few if and buts are associated with it. So today uh, we are going to hear about this technique from our expert orator, Dr. Krishna, with a very interesting title, is best swimmer the best sperm? 
Dr. Krishna Chaitanya. Uh, he is a scientific director at OSS Center for Reproductive Medicine, Hyderabad. He has done his postgraduate diploma in reproductive sciences and masters in clinical embryology from Monash University. His area of interest are mainly cryobiology, in vitro maturation, and andrology. And we all know him so well by his wonderful um, scientific uh, presentation in various national and international forums. So over to you, Dr. Krishna. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction, Dr. Manisha. So let's just move on with uh, today's presentation. So it's the best sperm, uh, the best sperm, so microfluidic sperm selection. So let's just throw some light, uh, which uh, off late has been discussed a lot in uh, the field of ART. All of us have seen this uh, particular picture multiple number of times. Uh, four decades of ART being in field right from 1978. Uh, it's, it's crossed four decades. Uh, there's a lot of research that's happened, but unfortunately, our success rate is still not 100%. We all you know, understand and appreciate the fact that there are multiple facets that are involved in order to get the best outcome from these ART cycles. And there's been so much of focus on the culture systems. There's so much that has happened with the female uh, when it comes to workup and interventions and management but not much that's happened with the sperm. Um, and, and thanks to the last decade where the focus of research is going more on sperm selection, because again, we all understand that sperm's playing an important role in um, bringing about success in ART cycles. So, you know, even after understanding the complexities of the ART processes, uh, we then said, you know, there are still challenges. We're not able to give 100% success. And that is where we moved on a lot of scientists around the world wanting to bring in automation, wherein we could bring down the bias, the errors, uh, we could bring in consistency in performance. And that is where lab on chip has been one of uh, the topics that's been um, under discussion and research in the recent uh, times. So of the various aspects, again, when it came comes to the sperm, I think, Microfluidic sperm sorting is one of the way where we could um, offer or look at sperm selection based on this automation process or lab on chip process. And that is what we're going to be discussing. So microfluidics isn't something that just came up in the year 2020. It's been there since 2003. The first publication was from the Takayama group. Uh, again, it's a university in the US where Takayama is a very senior scientist. It's got a wonderful blog. Uh, and has been doing a lot of research on microfluidics. You do get some free time. You could actually go to his blog. Uh, quite an interesting blog to read. Um, and uh, there's so much more that microfluidics uh, is actually offering. Uh, we're only talking about sperm selection right now, uh, but the ap application is much more than that. Uh, so time permits, do visit the blog of uh, Dr. Takayam. I think that is what all of us um, really want to look at it, look and get hold of that one winning sperm from the millions. And forever, for the last four decades, there's been so much of research where people have looked at different techniques, right from the traditionally used uh, the gradient technique or magnetic cell separation, physiological ICSI, MC and now of microfluidics. All of them and with their own principles are looking at optimizing the sperm selection criteria, be it the IUI, IV for XC cycles, we would want to have the best sperm so that we have the best reproductive outcomes. So that brings us to the main discussion point of today, microfluidic sperm sorting. So it's basically uh, dependent on principles of precise movement of microparticles in a controlled environment. It's basically using the principle of kinetic properties of the sperm cell. And how does this all work? It's based on the physical aspects of the sperm, that is density, size, shape, and motility of the sperm. This is the basic principle on which the microfluidics chamber or the microfluidics chip is working. So that's a quick pictorial view 
of uh, what exactly is happening in a microfluidic thing. So on your left hand side, you load semen as per the vendor's specification. And then uh, there's a chamber where the media is put in. And uh, then based on the laminar airflow and the other physical characteristic that we just mentioned, uh, that is the density, size, shape, and motility, the sperm cells do get channelized into different chambers where the motile normal sperms uh, get channelized into certain chambers. The abnormal, the dead the debris are getting into another uh, chamber. So that's ideally how a microfluidic chip uh, is working. Quite a simple uh, chamber to actually work with. Um, so uh, these are the two commercially available products right now available in the Indian market distributed by companies. So Qualys is one company and Zymote is a co uh, another company. Uh, both are available um, and distributed in India. Uh, in our experience, we have used both the uh, chambers and both equally do well. Uh, so if somebody is really wanting to experiment or try and get this into your practice, uh, it is available for us in India. It is not something that is still at a research level. Uh, we have been able to uh, translate into clinical practice. So what are the benefits of this microfluidic chamber? It, it is quite an inexpensive uh, process when we're comparing it to either magnetic cell sorting or uh, physiological ICSI dish or MC. On the other hand, it's, it's quite an inexpensive economical product. It's very, very simple to use. Uh, it's quite cost effective. It's, it offers us with higher percentage of motile cells, higher percentage of morphologically normal cells, and also gives us sperms with a good DNA quality. And the best part is it can be actually put through any kind of sperm parameter. If you're really looking at Max or Pixie, I think there is a limitation. Uh, there are um, certain papers which say that count anything less than 5 million. Uh, Max or Pixie might not be the best uh, uh, intervention in order to optimize sperm selection, but microfluidics uh, can be um, put across to any kind of uh, sperm uh, count. Uh, in fact, there have been uh, studies where they've tried and used it on micro TC and TC samples as well. Um, will the existing Qualys or Zymote available really help us obtain uh, selection of best testicular or surgically retrieved sperm uh, is, is something that still needs validation, but there are papers which say that even on testicular sperm, microfluidics is something that can be applied. So quickly, where are the indications where we could actually use the microfluidic sperm sorting technique? Uh, it can be a routine process where it can be used for IUI. We don't really have to do the uh, traditionally used double density method or the swim up. You could just load the raw semen sample and in a particular chamber, chamber you will have the separated sperm cells which are ready for insemination. It could be used in the routine IVF ICSI process. In cases where there's raised sperm DNA fragmentation in ducts, this can be an active intervention to obtain sperms with good DNA quality. There are uh, research papers in the literature which have said that in cases with failed implantation, um, sperm sorting with microfluidics has shown to uh, give good results. And finally, in use of uh, testicular or surgically retrieved sperm is also another indication of microfluidics. So this is the latest paper that's published by the Manipal group, Satish Adiga, Professor Satish Adiga's group, a wonderfully done a large study where they're actually compared the sperms which are processed and prepared by microfluidics and they've compared it with the traditional methods. And they've uh, inferred and concluded from the study that sperms that are processed and prepared by microfluidics have a higher viability and their longevity of survival is better. So that gives a better outcome of an IUI cycle. They've also looked at the DNA fragmentation and they say it's uh, kind of helps reducing uh, the DNA fragmentation or obtaining sperms with good DNA. And of course, they also say that it's, you're gonna get a higher fraction of motile cells and morphologically normal cells um, free to download from uh, um, uh, PubMed. So 
uh, feel free to read this paper, wonderfully designed and done by Satish Adigar's group. Um, so this was another comparative study of doing an IUI where the sperm was processed with the microfluidic method and the double density uh, method. And uh, this particular um, study actually found a better ongoing pregnancy rates with the microfluidics over a double density method, which is the commonly uh, utilized uh, process. Uh, this uh, was a comparative study, one of the largest study that's been published in the literature, published in Human Reproduction in the year 2018, where they've actually tried and compared you know, the extent of DNA fragmentation reduction with the uh, swim up and double density gradient uh, methods. And they found that uh, when compared with the double density uh, method, uh, microfluidic really offered a significant reduction in sperms with a, um, you know, higher DNA fragmentation so you get the best uh, DNA uh, qualities. Uh, so uh, microfluidics is uh, a technique which is helping in lowering the sperm's DNA fragmentation. So this is the abstract that was sent by our center, Oasis uh, Fertility, uh, this year at ASRM Abstract, and it's been accepted for presentation. Um, if uh, we wanted to see if microfluidics would help us uh, reduce the sperm's DNA fragmentation. So of all the patients recruited here, we saw that in the NEAT sample, the average DNA fragmentation value was around about 24%. Wherein, after doing the DNA, uh, the microfluidic separation, we then uh, through SESA method looked at the uh, DNA fragmentation, and the average was around about 2.1%, where uh, four was the maximum DNA fragmentation that we saw from uh, post microfluidic sorting that was done. This was another observational study, again an ASRM abstract, where they looked at the euploidy rates wherein um, microfluidic sperm was used and they say that the euploidy rate and the pregnancy outcomes were better with microfluidic uh, uh, selected sperms. So of all the available literature so far, this it has been the only randomized control trial that's been published so far in the year 2018. They randomized uh, patients into the traditional normal way of double density gradient versus uh, the microfluidic chamber, and they actually intended to look uh, till live birth rate. And as per this RCT, um, where I think um, around about uh, 100 odd patients were recruited, they found no difference in the clinical pregnancy and live birth rates between uh, no intervention, that is just doing a routine double density process versus doing a microfluidic uh, sperm sorting. But this is um, the only RCT that's available in the literature so far. So um, with all that literature that we've reviewed so far, um, yes, it kind of looks quite encouraging that microfluidics is simple. You just have to load the raw sample in a very shorter duration. You're going to get a good um, um, concentration of processed sample with good motility and morphology. But what matters is the outcome. We, uh, that is something that we really have to wait on. Till date, um, there isn't a meta-analysis or a systemic review uh, done specific to microfluidics uh, to uh, talk about the efficiency where we could adopt this as a routine procedure. Um, and you know, for all IUI, IVF, ICSI, we just try and do a microfluidic uh, separation is something that is yet to be proven. So this is an ongoing randomized control trial at OASIS. Uh, I'm sure you all are aware that in the last ISHRAE that recently happened, that uh, online thing, uh, we did present our RCT data of TISA versus MAX. Uh, this is more for patients with raised sperm DNA fragmentation. We wanted to see which intervention really works out well. And our experiences to live birth rate when we randomized between TISA and MAX, it didn't really uh, have um, any benefit in the sense there was no superiority of TISA versus MAX. So what we have done is we've extended this study into four arms where we've included microfluidics and daily ejaculation into it. This is still recruiting patients. Um, and I'm hoping we, by the next ASHRAE or ASRM, we should have some meaningful data uh, because these are the most commonly applied interventions 
in cases with raised sperm DNA fragmentation, hope uh, this RCT would give us some meaningful data. But however, I would want to share the interim results. Uh, let me caution you all, this is just the interim results of whatever patients we've recruited in our RCT. And the fourth arm, which was the daily ejaculation, uh, we've intervened, but we do not have any embryos transferred. So I only have the data of these three arms, which is max, T7, microfluidix. Of the various patients recruited in this forearm RCT, I think this is the clinical pregnancy rates and implantation rates. Uh, again, I don't think there is any gross benefit of one intervention over the other. But again, um, I would not really uh, um, say this is the take home message to say either microfluidics is the best or Max or Tzar is the best intervention. I think we'll have to wait a bit more to get that particular influence. So to wind up take home uh, message, is microfluidic sperm sorting the best way of selecting the sperm? Well, from the observational studies and the literature so far from 2003 till date, uh, is trying to show that you know it kind of offers the best way of selecting uh, the sperm. Uh, can it be offered to all? Yes, I think we could do a IUI, IVF, ICSI, even on testicular sperm. Uh, but can this be a regular routine clinical practice? I think we still need to wait until more RCTs and uh, meta-analysis systemic uh, reviews are going to tell us um, whether this can be made a routine clinical practice. Will it improve on uh, the embryo development, the blastocyst formation rates? Yes, that's the RCT, which was published in 2018, did uh, say that the grade one embryos available for transfer was significantly better in the microfluidics group. Uh, so it definitely is a promising intervention. Will it improve our reproductive outcomes, implantation rates, live birth rate, or reduction of miscarriage rates? Uh, two less data in terms of this, uh, but the RCT, which was the single RCT, did not really show much of a difference in take-home baby rates. Long-term safety, the perinatal outcomes or the follow-up of these kids born out of microfluidics, I think uh, we don't really have much data on that uh, aspect. Uh, so the benefit versus risk of using microfluidics is something that still needs to be looked on. Um, I don't um, really say do not use microfluidics, but I think that a word of caution, you really have to individualize, sit and discuss this with your clinical team and your patients as well. Um, quite, a, um, uh, quite an interesting, promising uh, uh, intervention, which is reducing the time. And uh, we've been using this for the last two years. Uh, looks uh, very nice. Uh, but can I really in a scientific form say that it is the best way? I would really uh, hold on my words and uh, request you all to watch out for more research to come um, and please take this with a pinch of salt. Thank you so much, Ahira and Adbi for that wonderful opportunity for helping me share our experiences with microfluidic sperm sorting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, um, Krishna, uh, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, it was, uh, you have given a complete picture, complete insight about the literature and uh, added uh, benefit was your own experiences. So after listening to your talk, I really wanted to know what is your criteria of selection of patient uh, whom you are putting in for microfluidics? Because it seems quite promising and it's quite easy. Well, that's why I said that's something that needs to be defined. So we have what tried you? this on IUI patients, IVF ICSI patients as well, but I think for us, the first indication is, you know, has there been a failed cycle before? We haven't really been doing this routinely for everyone. Let's say there's a first, a couple coming for an IV fixy cycle for the first time or in the first IUI cycle. Uh, I don't think we've really used this because there's no data supporting on that. Uh, and it gets very tricky and difficult to convince this onto the patient saying that this would really help them. So uh, failed implantation, uh, if there is a documented evidence of raised DNA fragmentation, yes. there have been quite a few cases where there's chronic uh, uh, genital tract infections or chronic uh, infections of the accessory sex glands. Even there, I think uh, we have tried and applied microfluidics and we see 
a significant reduction in uh, DNA fragmentation in dogs. So those okay. have been a few of the uh, indications where we've tried and applied microfluidics in our practice. Okay. What about OAT patient, Dr. Krishna, oligospermia patient? What is well, your talk about those? Because uh, it, is it works well. It works well. Um, you know, as a part of our RCT where we're recruiting and doing it, you know, with, when we're doing the T's and mark, max, um, one of the biggest limitation was anything less than 5 millions, the max column would not actually give us the best recovery. And there are times where we have recruited the patient and at ICSI, we really had to tell them we've not got any recovery. But with microfluidics, I think it's, it's very nice. There are times where we've had less than 1 million samples uh, with probably 5 to 10% of non-progressive mortality. And um, we've had recovery. Uh, which is enough for ICSI. You know, again, it wouldn't be something that uh, we could do an IUA because especially the Zymote chamber, which is available, uh, they claim and even we have seen that the recovery is enough to do an IUA because you at least have 10 million total motile sperm cells in uh, that post-recovery. Uh, but this can be applied for a severe male factor uh, infertility as well. Works works well. Uh, same your take uh, for TISA sample as well. Well, we are validating it. We've had mixed uh, uh, experiences. I would say, again, single digits that we have done. It's the cost factor that's limiting us because teaser all, all already costs so much. And um, there have been two samples which were done for basically raised sperm DNA fragmentation. That's our practice at Oasis. So um, the recovery was good. Uh, but uh, when we tried doing it on a non-obstructive azospermia where the concentration was less, I think uh, the recovery was absolutely poor. And uh, so I think uh, more numbers to come there before I could really put across and say what has been our experience. Thank you so much. And I really wanted to know uh, actually your first hand experience about the blastulation rate in these uh, experiments. Like. Uh, again, you know, I don't want to bias and a lot of bigness there uh, sounds encouraging. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, you know, uh, our clinicians actually are a big fan of microfluidics. You know, there are times where they just want to say, can we do microfluidics the first time? And, you know, we, we kind of work on protocols and we say, you know, there's no indication we would not really want to do that because we're worried about the safety aspect. We're not processing the semen. Uh, though it, it's a cleaner preparation that's coming, uh, we are a bit concerned and worried if the whole capacitation process and acrosome process, uh, reaction is happening the right way. Well, we have had no concern with fertilization. But that's a little question in my mind, and I would really want to make that as a routine practice. But capacitation, anyway, we are doing at the time of ICSI. So, uh, because. Uh, yeah, so um, we've, the experience has been good. You know, I just don't want to say it's fantastic, excellent, and people just wanted to go and do all of that. I just want to leave it balanced at this point because we are really short of data at this point in time. You know, that's, that's what so many times that happens, be it PGT, um, and in fact, ICSI for that matter, we all went with uh, without an indication doing ICSI for all or PGT for all. And now I think the uh, larger studies are trying to say it's not making any uh, difference. Uh, so I think definitely something that we will have to be balancing it out and wait for more data. But if you're wanting to do this for failed implantations or in cases with raised sperm DNA fragmentation. I think it's kind of promising it works well. You could try it out. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Krishna, for your honest and unbiased opinion. That really matters a lot for all of us. There are a few questions, uh, Chil. May I, I take these questions? Is time permitted? Sure, we can take a couple okay. of questions. So, uh, Tasni wanted to ask treatment you recommend for SOSperm example. I guess she wanted to ask uh, about OAT or oligosperm examples. So, we have already discussed about it. Then, uh, Pushpendra wanted to know IVF lab check in Q QCQA. I can't get this. QCQA in, uh, with the respect to microfluidics. Dr. Krishna, would you recommend something? Well, you know, sticking to the protocol, it's simple. You just add a, um, uh, you know, the required amount of media and without air bubbles, you just push the sperm mm -hmm. sample. Uh, they ideally say they want a moist chamber that would help us get the best recovery. I think apart from that QCQA, I haven't really seen any challenges with the TQM as part of the uh, microfluidics chip. 
Dr. Krishna Kalita wanted to ask the same thing, best sperm preparation technique for OAT samples because those are the most challenging ones. Well, I, I would probably take half that question. I wouldn't know if it's the best. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you have a severe uh, OAT sample, mm -hmm. right now, whatever literature is saying, I think you could do a testicular sperm aspiration. You know, the uh, indication of doing a uh, mm -hmm. fine needle aspiration or a testicular sperm aspiration is uh, broadening. Earlier, we only thought non-obstructive azoospermia or azoospermia would do it. But now raised DFI, cryptozoospermia, severe oligozoospermia, or even failed implantations. There have been papers of Cornell University and uh, um, um, I forget the Brazil uh, person, Sandro Estevez, who actually has shown that doing TISA would actually help. So severe oats, microfluidics, TISA, um, uh, are something that are trying to uh, be promising. But again, uh, we'll have to wait because they're not much of evidence supporting. So Chetna, we have already answered your question. She wanted to ask the same thing. If a person is having severe OIT, then PSA TSA will give good sperm or not. So we have already answered. Then Ashad uh, Rizvi, uh, sorry, uh, Divya uh, wanted to ask, how can we treat globozoospermic patients? All right. Well, out of the microfluidic things, but I think uh, globozoospermia, first of all, I think that is something that cannot be missed by your andrology person itself. They're going to be nice gold metal sperms round with no caps on there. There's no way you're going to miss a globozoospermia diagnosis. ICSI is the only treatment. So while doing ICSI, two things that need to be kept in mind, um, they're motile. You know, there's no problem and challenge with their motility. We're only worried if the fertilization is going to be less. Uh, because the acrosome isn't there, we, we are not sure what the internal uh, whole molecular process are going on. So while doing ICSI, uh, a little extra sucking and leaving probably two times. You know, if you really go with Thomas Ebner's paper, he says, go suck from the corner, come to the middle, suck a bit extra and leave it. Um, you could do that little extra sucking bit. And of course, calcium ionophores. Again, Thomas Ebner has got so much of literature supporting it. Um, any kind of calcium ionophore which you're using, we use calcium ionophores in our practice and it actually works well. The fertilization is good, but uh, coming to the blastulation rates, I think they've been varying this, but if you get a blast, the chance of implantation is there. There are very few papers who've looked at PGT and euploidy and all of that. So thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. If uh, Madam, I Madam moderator, with your permission, can I ask a question? All yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, Krishna, wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, contaminated and infected samples. And we know that the, they uh, often lead to the raised uh, DNA fragmentation thing. But my main concern is about the contamination and infected uh, samples. Because what uh, I guess microfluidics cannot totally eliminate the microbes. So mm -hmm. this is one thing which I'm always worried about, especially when we are uh, preparing our samples for uh, UIs or a conventional IVF. What do you think? Absolutely, I agree with that, uh, Sanjayji, because you know we've tried, uh, our uh, intent or way of in, uh, indicating here is if there is raised DNA fragmentation where we constantly see genital tract infection, which they're not responding to antibiotics. It is chronic inflammation. Active infections, I think it's a no-no because again, as I said, I'm not really sure how far the seminal plasma separation is happening. There's active infection that could in turn contaminate the cultures or lead to endometritis if it is getting into the uterine cavity. So a lot of care and concern to be taken there. Uh, but will it really help? Again, we need studies which really look deeper into this. Right now, the RCT, what we are doing at OSIS is only for raised sperm DNA fragmentation. We're not looking at the other indications right now. And the, the um, infections like the viral infections, I'm a little more worried because- Absolutely, uh, I would totally yes. not recommend especially in zero discordant couples where you're really wanting to keep the female partner, partner negative, I would still go with double density gradient method with a double washing. I wouldn't recommend this for high risk patients at all. And then especially the way, the way it works, 
uh, I don't really think the universal precautions can be adhered to. Uh, so, word of caution there. Not not suitable for you. You know, I have I have been using this microfluidics for uh, my scene uh, cases, but uh, once this pandemic uh, uh, set in. I in fact stopped using it because we do not know about the possible transmission uh, of coronavirus through uh, uh, sperms. Uh, we cannot uh, be uh, certain about it. So uh, this uh, led me to halt the, the usage of microfluidics and went back to the classical double density gradient. I hope uh, this gets over soon so we again start using it. Absolutely, but quite a promising method. Um, and in difficult cases, I think we can look forward to do microfluidics. Thank you very much and congratulations for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. And uh, Sanjay, uh, if um, time permits, I really wanted to ask one question. This technique uh, looks quite promising. And, uh, and uh, we all were looking forward towards it for uh, its um, uh, Apparent benefits, but what do you think? What could be the reason behind uh, after this RCT? We are quite discouraged because, in spite of getting good uh, embryos for freezing, good blastulation rate, everything seems very promising. But RCT, uh, like finally, uh, uh, take home baby rates or um, TRPs, those, uh, those are still the same. So, what could be the reason behind it? Why so, that is, that is where I showed that first slide with you all. I'll, I'm just quickly sharing it. You know, it's multifactorial. Sperm is one aspect of it, and there are multiple other variables inside the laboratory. Uh, so, you know, um, we can't be unidimensional where we say, okay, I've done microfluidics, I've got the best blast, best implantation, and, it, and the whole credit is given to microfluidics. Uh, I don't think that's the way it's going to go. So there are a lot of things that are coming in the way there. Thank you, Dr. Krishna, because when we get best uh, embryos, we become quite hopeful when we compare. So, <laughs> <laughs> in, in fact, you know, again, that's my personal this with uh, I, I, some of we use a lot of testicular sperm with this raised DFIs and everything. And we actually see beautiful blastocysts. And you know, we always thought that would give the best outcome. And the RCT disproved that, you know, there was no benefit of Max versus TISA. It was all the same. And our own study was saying, you know, don't go with an invasive teaser, rather do a max thing, but we leave it to uh, individual group to make, take a call as to which one really helps. These are the challenges we are looking forward. Absolutely. I think individualization of treatment cycles with each couple where the clinical team and the lab team are sitting together and working is the need of the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. Uh, over to you, Akash. Thank you, Dr. Krishna, for that wonderful session and a balanced view of the microfluidics uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manisha, and thank you, Shukla, sir. Uh, I would like to take the session forward and uh, call upon uh, you to do the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Kash, for your kind introduction. So now for the second session, I'll welcome Dr. Vaid Prakash, who is a lab director of Southern Fertility and IVF Delhi NCR. He has trained in IVF and ICSI from Andrology and IVF lab in at KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore, and advanced IVF and ICSI and embryo biopsy training at AZVU Brussels, Belgium. He, he is a president of Academic of Clinical Embryologists India and a founder of International Human Embryology Research Academy, and he is a Faculty Fellowship in ART MIT University, Noida. He is a visiting, uh, visiting fest, uh, faculty uh, at MSc in ART, Mysore University. And his area of interest is in vivo fertilization of blastocyst formation and innovation in embryo culture system. So welcome Dr. Ved Prakash, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shoshita, for nice introduction. So, uh, in first uh, wonderful lecture, we heard about microfluidic from Dr. Krishna Chaitanya. Now, moving on to next uh, lecture, semen analysis, man versus machine. So, it is also very wonderful lecture. Actually, uh, our uh, Dr. Cherry Yang is here to present that lecture. Uh, nowadays, you know that AI is uh, coming up in uh, ART sector also. 
and we are uh, selecting embryo uh, by the use of AI. So now here we are going to uh, see that how that AI will assist us in uh, simulation also. So Dr. Cherry Yang, she is uh, uh, done MSc in Marketing, University of East Anglia, and Bachelor uh, from Tung Hoi University. And she is a director of product development and marketing division director, responsible for product development and planning, responsible for product marketing education. Uh, her experience is more than 12 year, uh, years experience in medical field. Boyd Anta Corporation, director of marketing department from uh, November 2012 to uh, May 2017. And Bionime Corporation, 2008 to 2012 as a senior manager of marketing department and universal scientific industrial committee uh, company limited uh, 2004 to 2008 so over to dr cherry Yen. okay so thank you so much dr vat it's my pleasure to have your introduction so let me to share my screen okay okay so we all know that uh uh, computer assist uh, semen analysis systems has already existed in the world around for 20 years. But most of lab, they still choose to use the traditional manual examination. Why CASA cannot replace the manual way? So today I'm going to introduce you the background of the manual and also the machines to, that, to let you have more a clear concept. So first of all, I will start with the manual semen analysis. We all know that if you want to check uh, the semen samples, first of all, you need to check the liquefaction status. So you need to use a road to, to check if the sample is still uh, has high viscosity or not. Uh, if it is become watery, then, then you need to check its colors. And after that, you need to make a note. And after that, you need to check the pH strip, uh, pH value by pH strip. And also you need to put the sample collection cup with the sample in, on top of the wet scale to measure its width and transfer it to volumes. And uh, after that, you need to mix the sample very well and get a drop of sample on the counting chamber and put the con uh, counting chamber into the microscope and start to do the calculation. And after that, you still need to watch uh, the counting chamber. So it has a huge steps. So all of the step is more than not. Uh, so it takes you around nine steps and costs you around 15 to 20 minutes to finish one test. However, if you want to get the result of the morphologies, you need to take another 12 steps and cost you around one hour to get all of the result. So we all know that more steps means more possibilities to uh, make the mistakes. So I believe most of the lab, they still uh, want to use the simple operation procedures rather than complicated one. Uh, this is not because it is easy to be operated, but also it could reduce the chance to get the mistakes by manual. And besides, the subjective of the menu is always a problem to get a consistent result. For example, a different operator to exam the same sample, sometimes it will easy to get three totally different results. So uh, this is the reason why the CASA system was born. Uh, uh, I believe that there are many CASA around the world but basically it could be divided into two different types. The first one we call it image base. Uh, it's very simple. It only adds on the camera on top of the microscope and uh, take the picture. And after that, it send the pictures to the computer for the analysis. And Hamilton Throne and Microtip, this kind of company, they develop this kind of te uh, technologies. However, uh, the results still need to be double checked. So we call it semi-automatic. And there is another type, we call it signal base. Uh, basically they develop a special light and project this uh, beam to the object. So if the dimension of the object is similar to sperm's head, they will consider it as a sperm. So it's very difficult to distinguish the uh, sperm with the debris or round cell if the dimension is the same. 
Uh, however, this kind of machine uh, is fully automatic. So the result will be consistent. It won't be affect, uh, affect by human subjective. And um, MES, uh, the company in Israel is uh, the one who developed this kind of technology. And microchip, uh, Hamilton Throne and Mass is three of the well-known car cell manufacturing. And microchip and Hamilton Throne, they have the similar development, uh, product development. Uh, their new versions, they all create the automatic platforms and they all use a shell to cover up the platform together with the micro, uh, microscope. So in their new version, you cannot see the microscope but in their old version, you could still see the microscope beside the computers. Uh, uh, the uh, auto, automatic platforms could offer them to examine the multiple field automatically. But if you use their old editions and you want to change to another field, uh, you need to use the manual way to change it. And there is one thing very interesting because MES, they developed the signal base but in their new versions, they also allowed you to double check by image base, uh, especially for the very dirty sample. So I think that might be their limitations of this kind of technology. And the advantage of, of current CASAs we said that uh, if your lab have a high semen uh, analysis volumes, I will recommend you to use the uh, current CASA to reduce your workload. And besides, the CASA could improve the efficiency in lab uh, angiology labs. And besides, uh, if your lab have the high turnover rate, I will recommend you to use the CASA because we all know if your embryologist or technologist uh, quick, then uh, you need to uh, hire a new one. Uh, they might change their result and every re result will affect the parameters to make you a full diagnosis treatment. So this is uh, be a big problem for your own lab. And besides the last one is some lab, they want to buy the instrument to show that they are high tech. Uh, I don't know in India, but in many country, a lot of IVF lab, they want to invest the money to buy the CASA, not because they are useful, but because they could show that they are high tech. However, uh, CASA still have a lot of limitation. For example, it is very bulky. It takes a lot of space. So if your lab doesn't have enough space, it will be a big problem. And besides, if you have the experience to operate the CASA, you must know it is very complicated. It is not easy to learn how to use it. So the current CASA still you know, confuse the person to operate it. And besides, as I said, that the CASA is semi-automatic. So it could be changed by, by manual. So the variation in inter-observer result, it still exists. And besides, uh, most of the manual operation procedure are still exist in CASA. So they still require considerable amount, amount of time to get the report results. And the last one, but the most important one is the CASA is very expensive. So most of the lab maybe they have interested in CASA, but you know, the high cost that them need to consider a lot. But now there is a new technology of semen analysis. We call it Landsbrook S1 Pro. And this technology is very different from current. Uh, it also used the image base, but it integrated it on a microscope lens and also developed its own uh, hardware platform together with their uh, ag uh, algorithms. And first of all, it minimized the microscope lens. As we know that the mic most of the traditional microscope is very big, it's bulky but it reduced the size, the, the length of the size into one centimeters and packed the lens into a module less than four centimeters to replace the traditional microscope. And this technology is very unique. And besides, it also create its own hardware. It, uh, the hardware uh, integrate the light 
uh, high definition image and autofocus computing, computer peripheral, and also the power systems. So all the hardware platforms is unique for Lenswork X1 Pro, not like the general cars that only buy one uh, computer and install their own algorithm. And besides uh, Lenswork X1, uh, S1 Pro used artificial intelligence to develop its own algorithm. It adopts the machine learnings. It collects more than a million of the sperm images as the input and put this input for the way educate uh, embryologists or technologists to do uh, feature extractions. So uh, if they uh, so it get a lot of feature extractions, then the machine could do the classification automatically to produce the output. So if more uh, images that the input offers, then we could get more feature extraction. So the classification will more be, uh, more precisely, and the output output will become more correctly. So. S1 Pro is proud to say that it could uh, examine uh, the semen sample and get a very correct uh, result fully automatically. But current cars are, they cannot do that because they still need to use the manual to double check the result. So according to the pictures here, you can see that this is the traditional uh, car house algorithm. So in these pictures, you can see there is a lot of color dot. That means that it is uh, the sperm, but it moves in a different way. The red one means it is immotile sperm. So in this image, you can see they still could consider some debris show around cells into the sperm. But in these pictures, you can see the X1 Pro could distinguish uh, the sperm very precisely. And this technology has already applied for more than 57 patents uh, from USA, EU, China, and also Taiwan, and get around 43 issues already. So it's the outlook of Lenswork X1 Pro, and it's very fast and simple. It only takes you three steps, cost you two to five minutes to get all of the test results, not only for pH concentration, motility, and also morphology, but also all of the CASA parameters. And it is also fully automatic. So I would like to show you the product features by the video.
So uh, this product has already got the certificate from many countries. For example, the FDA from USA, CE for European country, an MPA for China, etc. And it has already sold to more than 40, uh, 55 uh, countries already and been adopted by more than 900 IVF uh, labs in the world. And besides, it's also got a lot of publication. And the update is uh, publication. Uh, the articles is accepted by the World Journal of Men's Health. And actually, this uh, journal uh, got the impact factors more than 5.5, uh, and it has already become the number one journal in male infertility. And many people were curious uh, how Let's Work X1 Pro to do the sample calculation. Uh, first of all, it set up the database for the pH value inside this machine. So if you want to do a, a, a sample examination, you need to apply two drops of the sample. The first one in this area, it will help you to get the pH value. And the second one, you need to apply the volume, a sample volume here to get a, another concentration, motility, and also morphology. So when you insert the test cassette into this machine, the first lens will detect this area and to compare the image with the database to get the pH value. And besides the second exam area, we offer you uh, the concentration. So if, when you insert the test cassette, the second lens will take uh, the photos to exam 100 grid. We know that WHO uh, 5 edition only recommend you to exam for 20 grids, but lens for X1 Pro could allow you to exam a uh, totally 100 grids to get the result. So when they take the pictures, the algorithm will start to distinguish which one is sperm and which one is not. And then sum up the sperm count and divide it by the sample volume to get the concentration. And about motilities, the second lens will take another 40 five uh, images to get the videos so that it could check the pathway of each sperm and classify it into non-progressive, progressive rapidly, and also immotile. And after that, it will uh, uh, add the non-progressive with the progressive one as the mo uh, motile sperm count and divide it by the total sperm count to get the percentage for motility. And uh, it will also take a very high definition uh, photos and it will measure each sperm from head to tails. And based on uh, WHO street criteria, which is the Cougar criteria to distinguish if this, this sperm is normal or abnormal. And then it will use the normal sperm count to divide it the total sperm count to get the morphology rate. So how about the performance of Lanshook X1 Pro versus the manual SEMA analysis? According to the validation report from Cleveland Clinic, uh, they use the intra-observer agreement to examine the repeatabilities to prove the precisions. According to their experiments, uh, they ask one operators to examine the same sample by Lanshook X1 Pro's machine for three times and to compare with the result for these three times. If the CV is less than 10, then it means it has the high repeat repeatabilities. So according to these report tables, you could see that Lanshook X1 Pro, the, the CV are almost uh, below to 10%. And besides, it's also used the inter-observer agreement to check the reproducibilities. According to uh, their experiment, uh, they ask three different operators to uh, examine the same sample by the same machine and to compare the correlation uh, with these three different uh, results. If they have high correlation, then uh, the uh, correlation will above 0.9. So according to the result table, you could see the correlation between uh, on concentration motility and progressive motility are all above 0 0.9. And also they want to check if Lanshook 
X1 Pro could get the similar result with theirs. So they uh, checked for more than 100 samples uh, from very low concentration to the concentration above 200s. And you could see the correlation on concentration, motility and uh, progressive motilities are all above 0.9. And because this is the medical devices, so they need to check the sensitivity and specificities for uh, this machine, not only use the linearities. So according to the report table, that's, that sensitivities means that if they consider this male is infertile and let's uh, almost tell the same story. And if they consider this man is health, uh, let's hope S1 Pro could tell the same things. So according to the report table, that most of the result could above uh, 85% and in concentration is almost 100% ac uh, accurate. So the conclusion, the manual semen analysis takes too many steps, which has the higher probability of making mistakes. And manual SEMA analysis is very subjective. So the result might be different from different operator or technologist. And current COSAS has two different technologists. The technology of single base cannot distinguish debris or run cell to sperm. However, the image base is not, not fully automatic. So which means its result is also be affected by manual subjective opinions. And the new technology of CASA, LensWorks One Pro, adopt the new uh, adopt an image base to develop the algorithm by AI, and it is fully automatic. And besides, its operation steps are much less than traditional procedures. So therefore, it could reduce the possibility to make the mistakes and also the manual subjective. And its AI technology could enable to differentiate the burn with established run cell more precisely. So that's my short presentation today, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. So we have some questions for after a wonderful uh, lecture. So let's see how many questions are there. So there is one question from uh, Amit Dholakia from Ahmedabad. How are viscous samples treated? Are they pre-treated to decrease viscosity and make the drop homogeneous? Okay, uh, I think homogeneous sample is very important, not only for manual, but also for most of the CASA. So for Lancet X1 Pro, that is definitely need, require the homogeneous samples. So I will suggest you to follow WHO5 editions to treat the uh, viscosity sample, which is put the sample into the water bath and at 37 degrees, and maybe after 30 minutes, you could check the viscosity with Will reduce a lot. And second question uh, is: Do we need to dilute the sample for calculation for lens scoop? Okay, uh, uh, I, I know this question must be uh, provided by a very, very serious lab because uh, uh, follow WHO five editions, they use the new bar counting chamber and that require like, the dilute sample. Uh, but now Lensu X1 Pro, you don't need to dilute the sample. It, it could allow to examine the fresh sample directly. Only make sure that the sample is homogeneous, not affect by viscosity or any liquefaction issues. And how does it perform in the low and high concentration? Uh, okay, uh, according to its spec, it could examine 0 0.1 million per milliliter to three million per milliliters. However, uh, although this machine could examine for 100 grit, but it could only examine for one uh, field. So if you want to use this machine and the concentration is really low, uh, lower than five million per milliliters, then I would suggest you to double check by manual because it could only examine one field. So if, if you see nothing inside, that doesn't mean there is really nothing. So for the very low concentration, uh, I say lower than five million, it's will manual way will be recommended to double check. Okay. And Another question is, how many sperm does lens count to determine the parameters? Okay. Uh, 
uh, when you uh, apply a drop of the sample onto the counting chamber, uh, lens for X1 Pro will calculate every sperm. So if the concentration uh, is 300, uh, is 300 million per milliliter, that means we might count for more than 3000 sperm count. So, but if uh, the concentration is really low, uh, I mean, if it's lower than 20 million per milliliters, then it might not count for 200 burned. So it depends on the concentration of your uh, sample volume. Uh, another question is, does lens soap could help you to determine the asthenogeospermia and oligogeospermia? Uh, yes, because uh, the, the, spec, uh, could, uh, the spec of this machine could allow you to examine for 0 0.1 million per milliliter. So I think uh, oligospermia is okay to examine. But is, if it is lower than five million per milliliters, I would suggest use the manual way to double check. Mm -hmm. And according to uh, the, the aspect of the motility, it could allow you to test for 1% to 100%. So uh, asena aspermia is also okay to use this machine to exam because they could over you uh, the, the answer that you require. One more question is, what is the sensitivity of the equipment? The sensitivity, I think according to the tables, the sensitivity compared with Cleveland Clinic is all above uh, 90%. So I think uh, it is pretty uh, accurate with the manual way, no matter in concentration, motility, and also morphology. And uh, one more question is, is there a correlation between the equipment and the macular chamber? Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there is an, uh, 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 a limitation between the uh, macro content chamber. But if you want to do the validation, I will uh, suggest you to use the uh, you know single ones uh, content chamber because macro content chamber is reusable. So if you did not uh, protect it very well, sometimes it will damage. For example, uh, there is one customer they used the uh, macro content chamber to compare with the result with sense as one pro but found that their concentration is too high and after that the, they check their counting chamber and found that the gap uh, between uh, the lens and the, the base is too it is too high so it changed the result so if you want to do the validation and you use the fresh brand new uh, counting chamber of marker, I think that is won't be an uh, issue. But if that is used too many times, I, will, I won't recommend you to compare the result. Use the single one use counting chamber will more you know, reliable to compare with uh, Lens X1 Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question is just two drop will suffice, especially when we have necrogeospermia. Okay, uh, I think the sample size won't be an uh, issue, but uh, this machine cannot uh, examine the vitality because vitality need to uh, process the stand technologist, but this machine doesn't use that technologist. So uh, if you apply uh, this kind of sample into the case, it will only show 100 immortal burn, but it could not show you the result of uh, vitality. One last question is, is there any calibration check needed if the machine is moved from one area to another? Okay, uh, this machine doesn't require any calibration, but we will suggest you to do the quality check if you move this machine to another, because we are so afraid that there is any damage between the transportation. So if you want to move the devices, the QC must be done, but if uh, it, the device uh, the devices stay in the same place. You don't need to do that. That is okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Terry. This wonderful uh, lecture. Actually, we are running short of time. So there are some more questions, but uh, sorry, uh, we have to move on. Thank you so it's much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. Please take over. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Cherry, and thank you, Vitsa. Uh, we had uh, now two wonderful sessions. One, the first session I was in search of the indication to use. And uh, if I may say the second session is about the probable user to use. It's in search of the user. The machine is in search of the user. So we'll move on to our next session, uh, which will be our panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Nidhi uh, to do the intro of the moderators.
Good evening to all. It's my honor to introduce the first moderator, Dr. Shweta Mittal Gupta. She is senior consultant in the Center of IVF and Human Reproduction, Sir Ganga Ram Hospital, editor of Indian Fertility Society, and treasurer AOGD 2020. She has been credited for the first pregnancy for frozen thought to cite North India, a recipient of Economic Times Award for inspiring obstetrician and gynecologist in IVF and also a recipient of Vigyan Vardhan Award for Oxy Ethicon Traveling Fellowship. It is the first fellow of National Board of uh, National Board Reproductive Medicine, a peer reviewer at the General of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics and General of Obstetric and Gynecology India. Not only a teacher, but she is also a person who guides and inspires her fellows and postgraduates. Now coming to the next speaker, Dr. Sanket Dumal. He's a senior clinical embryologist and heads the embryology unit at Kishma IVF Center and Reproductive Medicine Center, Justice K.S. Hegre Charitable Hospital, Mangaluru. He's an alumni of University of Mysore, then his MS in Genetics, Executive Committee Member of Academic of Clinical Embryologists, Ace India, you are team leader of IHERA. He's in the editorial board of general of JBRA Assistive Reproduction. Also a reviewer of four international Scopus index, uh, index journal, authored few publications, and to his credit, he has uh, he's an author and a co-author of three books. Chapter. He's a principal investigator for several projects at Keshma Medical College, a member of ACE and Ashray and Indian Science Congress. He's a regular faculty in the various national conferences and delivered invited talks and lectures, and has conducted multiple advanced workshops in the field of fertility and his area of interest are cryobiology and male infertility. Welcome to you, sir and ma'am. Thank you so much for a very kind introduction. Yeah. Uh, we have on the panel uh, quite experienced persons from the field of embryology and from the field of clinical andrology. Uh, first and foremost, we have Dr. Sarapit Singh. He's an MD from Ames. He's an IFS and SJ certified senior clinical embryologist, the convener for IFS SIG, and awarded the best convener for SIG for uh, for Division 2018-2020 Champion of SR Awards. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sarathri. And uh, next we have on panel Dr. G. Rahul Reddy. He is consultant microsurgical uh, andrologist, uh, fellowship with fellowship in andrology and men's health. He is the director for AndroCare Andrology Institute. Uh, he is a faculty in andrology for national and international conferences. Uh, he has uh, quite a few awards to his name with the Best Junior Surgeon Award 2010-11 in Apollo Group, Vaidya Ratna Award, Best Andrology Award, Pratibha Puraskar Award, Rising Star Andrologist Award, Hall of Fame Award in Andrology uh, 2019 from the Economics Time. Uh, welcome, Dr. Raul Redi, sir. Next, uh, we, I'd like to invite Dr. Chirag Gupta. He's a uroandrologist and microsurgeon from Santokhba Durlabji Hospital, Jaipur National University. His special skills uh, are in the field of microsurgical varicocele ligation, microtiza, microscopic VEA, VV, and penile implants. His special interests include male infertility and men's sexual health. Uh, he has to his credit first successful microscopic sperm retrieval and pregnancy with the sperms from Microtiza in Rajasthan. His faculty in UNESCO 2019, faculty for various workshops, including the Andrology workshop, had a video in UCCon, paper in UCCon 2017, and was awarded the best video competition for UCCon 2016. He has uh, quite a few publications to his name. Uh, and uh, publications in a books as well, a couple of publications mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. failure to produce a sample. And uh, we have next uh, Dr. Charlata. Uh, she has a total 26 years of uh, experience in medical diagnostics and ART field. Uh, she has been a faculty speaker and participants at various workshops, CMEs. Uh, she has learned from the veterans in the field, has organized multiple workshops and CME. She has publications to a credit journal of Ops and Gyne, Fertility, Sterility, and chapters in ISAR and IFS published books. Uh, she has abstract presentations at HSA, ESRM, and IVA Spain. And most important, she is the mother of two children and lives at Hyderabad with her husband, Devashish. Welcome, uh, ma'am. And next, we have Dr. Rahul Sain, working as Chief Clinical Embryologist at Nilkan Fertility, Jaipur, member of ACE, executive member of ISAR, organizing secretary for Embryology, ISAR 2018, and organizing committee member for national conferences, IFS, IMS, UI, ISAR, and UN Foxy. Welcome, Dr. Rahul. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Samshir Ali. He has MPhil in biotechnology and lab manager at Lifeline Multiple Multi-Specialty Hospital, experienced in clinical embryology with demonstrated history of working. He has a strong research professional skill in statistical data analysis and embryology. He has TQM. He is certified with embryo biopsy, CIVF, oocyte vitrification, blastocyst culture, and troubleshooting. 
over to you dr sinkar and uh, dr shivas dr akash and uh, thank you so much dr nidhi for that kind introduction and uh, so very good evening to all and uh, a warm welcome to this panel i think we have a very exciting and interesting panel today because there's a, a mixture of you no know, uh, andrologist as well as immunologist so we all know that infertility is on rise and the data was already there that both the partners are almost equally contributing to it and the male partner is often ignored and especially you know with the advent of icsi where all we need is a few live sperms and the treatment with the advent of icsi even took for the back seat the success rates have been increased because of availability of the better culture environment as well as uh, media but it has been plateaued in spite of this for the improvements so now once again the focus has been shifting to the root cause of the male as well as female infertility and as, as we all know that male contribution uh, no contribution of male is gaining prominence the way, the, the, the very pertinent question no and uh, therapy is do we need to treat the male or do we need to treat the sperm in this this webinar no we try to address this uh, very interesting question and our panelist will help us to shed some light on this so with this note i will take up the first question so how do you treat a male with uh, oligoastenosperma i would like to ask this question to dr rahul reddy or dr chira gupta yeah good evening everyone uh, any patient with uh, oligoastenosperma first thing is where to find out what is the root cause uh, for this whether this is a uh, hormonal issue or uh, whether this is an in, uh, obstruction related problem or is it because of varicose uh, once we identify the cause then uh, treatment starts just giving antioxidants alone may not help this uh, patients so first is clinical examination then hormonal evaluation and uh, if if necessary we need imaging studies Um, Dr. Chirak, uh, are you there? Yeah, yeah I am here. Uh, so, so I agree with sir. I agree with the Rahul sir. Um, clinical examination is of utmost importance. Actually, um, most of the times uh, diagnosis is clear only on in clinical examination. Only. You need not to do any investigation. At um, and as soon as the patient enter to your clinic uh, with a report of semen analysis of so and so. and uh, you take a short history and uh, starts your clinical examination things are mostly clear whether the patient is needing any assisted reproduction whether the patient is needing any hormonal analysis usually i use hormonal analysis once uh, it is moderate to severe oligospermia and uh, imaging study is usually not required um because most of the times uh, they are not uh, helping us in any way i use my handheld doppler for um, examining varicoceles and uh, with that handheld doppler i examine um, varicoceles and uh, grade them and once uh, uh, this is over um, usually i reach uh, a working diagnosis as well as uh, um, the plan of management if the patient is having very uh, low count and uh, um, then i will go for hormonal analysis at that time okay excellent so uh, with this we'll start with the sorry my screen is stuck yeah with the case scenario so there is a male that is male with a married life of 5 years and no addictions and no varicocele and on examination and no ed and no significant medical or surgical history and local examination showed nad so here is a sr report and where the count is 8 million per ml and 20% progressive motility 6% normal morphology fructose is positive and ph is 7.6 round cells are 3 to 4 uh, for hypo hypo field and uh, sample is not liquefied so how to proceed with this i would like to ask uh, the andrologist as well as the embryologist with this like how uh, what is the treatment options available you know for this and uh, what can be done from the lab end for this kind of scenarios can i come in yeah yes please. please please obviously uh if uh, uh, as far as the lab is concerned the andrology lab is concerned if sample is not liquefied within half an hour 20 to 30 minutes what we do is generally i don't prefer to use trypsin or any enzyme before i just take a 17 gauze needle and you know pass the 
uh, cement into it so that uh, it can uh, liquefy and then it will be easy to you know check the analysis and suppose it is only for the analysis and not for the preparation and still it is a highly uh, viscous sample then preferably we can use the trypsin enzyme to you know reduce the viscosity um i just uh, um want to add one thing that the sample is not liquefied so uh, one thing we can um find out that there is some problem um uh, with the liquefaction and the enzymes from liqui for liquefaction comes from raw state okay. so uh, maybe this guy and he is having some round cells also although they are not too much um so maybe this patient uh, is having this oligosteno because of some prostate infection so this can be a one okay uh, dr sarpreet uh, dr rahul uh, dr shamshir would you like to add it, anything to this dr chirag uh, it can be due to uh, prostate prostate prostatitis because round cells are seen uh, and it is not liquefied also so uh, primarily there are two approaches one is uh, if you are processing it in the lab so it can be done it, you are i mean what for are you processing this sample first you let me know sanket it could be anything like because it's like borderline you can you uh, know uh, using this therapeutic application for iui suppose imagine hypothetical situation where you are processing the sample for iui iui this sample so you have to liquefy it uh, dr charulata has explained nicely how to liquefy it we generally you know dilute it with some media or pass it through a Through a seven five seven two pipette, it actually works well for us. And then you can process it. It depends on the volume. Uh, have you mentioned the volume? No, you've not mentioned the, the volume. The volume you can consider as normal, like uh, above one point five mL. Okay. So if if we take two mL, then uh, because if it's an infection, then the volume will also be raised. If it is yeah. due to any prostatitis or anything, volume will also be raised. so in case the volume is more and the count the total uh, spermatic count total sperm count increases so then there are various ways of you know tapping the uh, most uh, most potent motile sperms so you can go for any of the methods so i i don't think we need to go into the details of sperm preparation yes uh, maybe we can split it into different tubes and you know uh, then club the pellets but it all depends on the volume correct so any other panelist would like to add anything to this so i don't know uh, with this uh, as uh, clinical pathology and uh, investigation has been already done but what can have been uh, done in previous situation is like the patient is already diagnosed with oligo uh, spermia uh, i would have uh, recommended like uh, sperm pooling like two or three ejaculates prior it can be pooled and use later for any procedures like if it's an iui or ivf whatever can be done it can be gone through uh, ejaculate pulling of ejaculates okay so yeah i agree with uh, charlotte ben as she mentioned i'll go with mechanical thing and uh, as rahul has mentioned a, a good point so we will pull up the cycle we'll pull up the samples and we can use for iui if it is ivf for ex uh, we don't need uh, not required yeah so uh, the answer would be like there are two options to uh, no uh, treat this kind of scenario like one is the enzymatic method the one is the mechanical method so most of us will go with the uh, mechanical method which is quite easy and uh, you know uh, is working out for us so for the first question is uh, already dr rahul did has mentioned this uh, you know the role of gonadotropins of for no idiopathic male factor fertility where uh, i've just picked it up from the cochrane where they said uh, there is encouraging the preliminary data on this but large and as well as multi center trials with adequate numbers and participants are needed and even with the you no know, with respect to anti accidents as well uh, they, they they say that for the large well designed randomized placebo controlled trials reporting on pregnancy and you know like lbr still required to clarify the exact role of anti accidents so coming to the question 2 uh can i comment um yeah yeah please sir uh looking to the gonadotropins use of gonadotropins in this case um i uh, really do not uh, do this and i do not support the use of gonadotropins empirically uh, 
um, as uh, most of the studies have not suggested any benefit if there is a you know kind of a low low condition that means low fsh lh and low testosterone then only it will work and uh, empirical use of gonadotropin is just a waste of time i think so yes yes okay so the second question will be uh, male with anazospermia has come with the previous two sa reports and the referral doctor has sent the patient you no know, to you for that essay and so how do you proceed with this uh first of all like uh, only two analysis for azospermia from the lab perspective it is i feel that uh, we should still do a one more analysis uh, and uh, once the semen is there uh, do the centrifugation check the pellet and whether is there any you know sperm in, sperm present or not that we should see at least three samples i feel uh, before labeling uh, the semen as as a spermia and then in three samples even in the pellet after centrifugation there is no presence of the sperm then probably we can ask patient for the trial tisa not directly tc so um, i agree with madam that cryptospermia should be ruled out and um, one thing is very important that as he has sent two reports we should look on, uh, look upon the ph uh, and fructose and volume of the sample as uh, mere azospermia does not uh, suggest anything um, if uh, it favors an uh, clear cut diagnosis like uh, low volume and uh, isospermia without any fructose then it's clear cut that we can use this as a sample and we can go ahead with the sperm retrieval and whatever we need if uh, um, it is a good volume sample with fructose positive and uh, then also it is an isospermia then we have two options that first of all we should examine him that uh, whether he is having any obstruction at the level of epididymis or there is any no kind of picture and then we can go ahead with whatever uh, options we have hormone analysis and then micro tsa and whatever we can perform as our uh, clinical specialist i would like to add the role of uh, genetic analysis here i think uh, if you explore the patient for micro deletions then we can pro- prognosticate the chances of sperm retrieval in in micro in in first in tsa and micro tsa both so i think genetic analysis has to be done uh, as part of the you know work up for the patient so dr rahul uh, would you like to add anything to this i think this is the patient where uh, they need uh, hormonal evaluation first just simple two hormones will tell us what is happening there fsh and lh as uh, they are raised then obviously we are uh, sometimes uh, test, we see sometimes is, this is not related with testicular value same patient on clinical examination if he has a small volume testis then we know that we are dealing with a patient of either hypo hypo or uh, hypertrophic hypogonadism that means testicular failure or hypo uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and sometimes uh, absence of vas difference uh, on both sides we call it as uh, congenital bilateral absence of vas difference that is also common uh, finding uh, we see at least three four cases every week Uh, that can be ruled out through uh, clinical examination and uh, volume and third one if volume is on the lower side then first thing is we have to ask how the patient is giving semen sample whether uh, he knows whether uh, pro- uh, how to masturbate properly or not how the, the sample the way of giving sample is also important if all are normal then my first uh, uh, preference is for hormones because we can prognosticate whether uh, we can decide what we are dealing with okay uh, i'll be adding i'll be adding one point yes, here. Uh, yes. as this patient is already referred from another doctor and right. the patient has uh, undergone two previous semen analysis report you know it is already <clears throat> very common that if this uh, semen analysis was done in an any uh peripheral okay. central yeah uh if that semen analysis is not being done from an art center so uh, we need to check again a report as uh, clearly mentioned by charu ma'am that again a single report will be uh, a useful tool to uh, basically label it as an azospermia or not i'll be looking on the previous two reports where are being they done 
and uh, who has actually checked those uh, or uh, quantified these reports okay so so that was wonderful i think uh, i know our panelist has covered almost all the points first and foremost thing will be the differentiation of hazardous permia whether it's obstructive or, or noa as dr chira mentioned and after that as dr sarbat mentioned is it, whether do we need any genetic testing with this because that helps us you know to counsel the patient what are the chances of uh, you know uh, uh, finding the sperm in the retrieval you know when you apply the retrieval techniques so once that is ruled up uh, once that is done then any intervention can be done you know prior to surgical retrieval treatment as uh, dr rahul mentioned and after that the most important thing is effective and efficient retrieval technique followed by the finally application of the techniques which are available in the lab so it's like well coordinated multidisciplinary effort where you know which is a key to offer the best possible chance of achieving a biological offspring to a patient with azospermia so with this uh, coming to the third question um, a couple has been posted for ivf cycle and the cause for infertility is unexplained infertility and the previous essay is shown as normosospermia but whereas on the day of opu the fresh semen sample is found to be cryptozospermia so how to proceed with this what are the possible options may I proceed sorry yeah, yeah. this patient uh, is already having normal semen analysis on the day of U, uh, opu the patient is found with cryptozospermia it right. could be because of spillage also so sometimes right. we are saying to the patient before collecting we have to you know as uh, from lab side we have to give a proper instruction how to collect and all in case if it if he is already uh, as you mentioned he is having a uh, good essay already i would ask him to give second sample after one hour i would ask him to give second sample uh, if it is for xc i uh, you have mentioned ivf cycle so i think few sperms are it means just like uh, yeah ivf for x whatever as patient has been posted for opu so I would go ahead with uh, second ejaculation, or even in second ejaculation, if you are not getting, we would be having a backup. We uh, in our protocol, we always uh, have a backup sample in our lab. So I would go ahead with uh, backup sample. I I thought that sample I'll use for XC. Okay, excellent. So anybody else to add anything to this? No. I think that's what uh, it's saying. It is a collection error should be ruled out. Number one. uh number 2 you know whenever uh, the first thumb rule for any uh, patient or any man who is coming to the as you correctly said that man is overlooked for the ivf and xc cycle so the instruction should be given very properly the audio video visual should be given into the collection room the container what we are giving should be wide mouth so there should not be any spillage this is all our basic very basic things but it is overlooked over the time so once we check all these and once we have all our you know standard operating procedure in the lab i think there should not be any issue handling with the real cryptozoospermic patient also so sanket i think in such cases history of uh, febrile illness is very important if there is a history of febrile illness in the previous 3 months then it might have contributed because he is normosospermic uh, on one occasion and now it is, now he is you know practically is spermic or cryptozoospermic so febrile illness has to be ruled out which might you know save the patient lot of investigations if he has a, had a fever or something for in the past 3 months then it sperm count might take some time to recover okay so i think uh, take home message from this uh, case study uh, is all all ivf centers should consider uh, freezing the sperm in spite mm. of normal uh, spermatogenesis especially everybody does now right. yeah. mm. very very true so very true so the options will be like no rightly mentioned by our panelist ask for the second ejaculate much before that check just check with the patient whether the patient has no has collected the complete sample or not whether there is any spillage while the time of collection just rule out that and ask for the second ejaculate if it is not if it is not available or is not able to produce the second ejaculate then look for the backup sample so like usually we in my lab we practice have uh, having no backup sample for every, every ivf case we have been posted so look for the backup sample if that is not available backup sample is not available due to various reasons then you can counsel the patient for surgical sperm retrieval if the patient is not willing for surgical sperm retrieval 
then the last <laughs> and option will be like who said prior preservation in case all these things are ruled out the patient is not able to produce the second ejaculate or you no know, there is no backup sample this is not willing for surgical sperm retrieval the last option will be you no know, freezing of the oocytes but uh, oocyte dr sanket uh, prior preservation yes, yes. Uh, is a time bound procedure and uh, for that particular situation yes. we need to be resorted in a situation like yes if the patient agrees and he gives up the consent then only i, to I totally agree with, with you yeah. dr rahul so sanket yes. it is a cryptozoospermia we can uh, get the sperm and uh, some motility yes, enhancer yes, yes. will help us to you know uh, improve it the motility like, like theophylline and all that pentoxifen can be used to improve the motility i don't think uh, because you know i agree that the everyone phone, should phone, have the, the backup sample but now where i am working the volume of my lab is i am doing 100 and plus pickups every month so it's not possible for me to have a backup sample for each couple <laughs> i was precisely uh, just was uh, telling the same thing and uh, so because it's cryptozoospermia so i'm sure embryologists will pick up plenty of sperms yeah. for the sperm yeah. of into sites but the, yeah. but the real question no real problem arises when there are not enough sperms no in the sperm. number of sites yeah. no no there are Apology less sperms and, uh, and more number of oocytes are there in front of you then that will be a challenging situation so and as rahul said uh, rightly said it's a time bound procedure where but in such kind of scenarios uh, this will not happen very often right so some compromise will be there but we cannot say there is no harm for that we should take care that uh, no we should freeze uh, uh, the oocyte as soon as possible so coming to the question four uh, you know the very controversial and you know hot topic the dna fragmentation so what are the reasons for high dna fragmentation oh multiple reason from protamine failure to reactive oxygen species to some kind of uh, you know very cosil lifestyle so many factors which can really affect the sperm dna so uh, from history taking to lifestyle to occupation to medical anything can be so the clinician or the andrologist will be the right person to rule out the possible causes for the dfi but as an uh, ivf or as an embryologist i can see that how the sperm should be dna uh, you know fragmentation free when it comes to into exhibit right. so in the panel yes sir please sir oh, we can differentiate high dfi patients into two two categories one where we can treat one where uh, sec second group where we can't treat like patients who already underwent uh, chemotherapy radiation there we can't do anything so clinically treatable uh, causes are only couple of causes one the commonest cause is uh, infections that particularly in indian scenarios either epidermal infections or prostate infections and uh, second one uh, is varicocele and third one is habits fourth one is obesity obesity is again a very common cause of high dna fragmentation because all these obese patients they have increased testicular temperature and which can cause uh, high dna fragmentation so only these causes we have to evaluate If there is something uh, which is treatable in these conditions we can treat okay. other causes like advanced age uh, people who are exposed to high radiation we can't treat them okay and uh, the sub question for that is no uh, so how to treat high dfi you no know, whether in this kind of scenario to treat the male is the right thing or to treat the sperm is the right thing so here uh, same thing if you have time treat the male if you don't have the time uh, if you don't have time then uh, treat the sperm <laughs> sometimes what we get is we get referral in the last moment where already ivf cycle has been started and if uh, patient comes to us with a high dna fragmentation report there we can't do anything that they, i think their their embryologist should step in and uh, treat the sperm so what are the guidelines is, what are the recommendations for this like we need to treat the male with the dna fragmentation first uh, there is no you know such factor even i tried uh, of the like if i can you know dna fragmentation is 
uh, cut off value if anything is there we can do max or microfluidics or daily ejaculation and uh, um, ICSI or uh, surgical sperm collection so you know i have a per patient who is having the 30 or 30 plus dfi and uh, just microfluidics and healthy baby whereas i have a borderline dfi done surgical sperm collection and still after transferring the oocyte I means embryo also made, lady might land up with the miscarriage so uh, it, uh, there is no female cause for the miscarriage so there is no cut off value that your 20 to 30 dfi you go with microfluidics 30 to 40 you go with max or uh, 60 you go for surgical as krishna has told very correctly that you know there is no um, means particular we have the conclusive reason or a conclusion that oh this from dfi so we have to use this technique and this might improve the our art outcome so mm, what i follow in my clinic is if i can um, diagnose a significant cause of high dfi then um, we should treat that first and then go ahead with whatever assisted reproduction method we are taking because there are many a times after failed four cycles, I have done varicocelectomy. So uh, this should not happen. First of all, varicocelectomy is a very cost effective method and it has proved several times that it helps. Not in every patient, but in certain number of patients. And if we are treating it after four cycles of, uh, you know, IVF or ICSI, then it is a, mm, a uh, not a justice to the treatment. Okay. So if you have a particular diagnosis that this is the cause, we can treat it. We should treat it. Otherwise, we can treat sperms because you all are very experienced now. That yes. is the best. Uh, as, as, an, as an embryologist, yes, treating the sperm will be a good option because time and time already has been taken by the couple for conception. They have already consumed so much long. And uh, for this, happens. yes, and for this again, um, uh, there is uh, one more technique which uh, I think all will be familiar with, and uh, especially I have uh, seen and got very good results. That is the pixie, where the sperms get bounded with the hyaluron, and basically they mimic the natural physiology, and those bounded sperm can be used later for uh, micro injection purpose. And uh, yes, Pixie uh, can be a good resort in this uh, rescuing this situation. You know, the high DFA, I think it is good to go with one of the techniques like yeah, yeah. whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, there are there are there are uh, multiple uh, techniques and options available. But yes, we need to look out what technique is working in our setup and what technique is actually giving us good results. And so, uh, yeah, it's like uh, we need to check that uh, uh, reports and everything. There is a very good study uh, in which uh, they have quoted that after a failure of uh, one IVF cycle and uh, they have performed the uh, uh, varicocelectomy and on, in that they have found that there is a 60% uh, results in the terms of pregnancy um, in which out, uh, out of 60%, 22% were not natural only. And uh, in second cycle, they have got 30 or 35% and subsequent success was in subsequent cycles like this. So, um, treating male is uh, never late because uh, assisted reproduction um, definitely will be helped by treating male. Yeah. These two things go hand, by, hand, hand in hand. We cannot choose anything, you know, anyone. Even, even uh, the same follows with the test of the this investigation for D DNA fragmentation. There are multiple options of DNA fragmentation tests available, kits available in the market. It is the efficiency of that particular kit, which kit is basically giving uh, what kind of result and what are they uh, basically used for. So uh, we need to check that also, like SCD, SCSA, uh, Comet. There are multiple uh, DNA fragmentation test options available, but uh, because of the expensive and uh, time bound approach, we go with the convenient options available for the investigation. So again, uh, the DNA fragmentation assays, what we are using is that also need, uh, uh, they should be efficient enough to give a good uh, report. Dr. Sarapit, would you like to add anything to this? I would like to uh, kind of uh, second what Rahul has said. 
in investigation is very important because generally you know if somebody is doing a hellosperm test or a scd test it's uh, it's very subjective it and actually dna fragmentation is something uh, i don't know uh, what the what levels you consider as abnormal or high because uh, you know uh, generally it varies from doctor dr chirag and dr dr rahul uh, reddy uh, that uh, what levels do you consider as high i mean uh most of the labs they consider uh, i follow scs method uh, yeah. 30 is upper limit 30 is the upper limit 30 right. is. so we also follow the scs method uh it is probably the most uh, studied and validated method if you look at the publications also but otherwise tunnel is the most specific method which unfortunately uh, i have not seen any com- any commercial uh, lab which was dealing in a tunnel assays in our country but we send all our samples for scsa only so if anything is more than 30 then uh, with the treatment protocol changes actually you know it's iua is forbidden So you have to consider either IV or ICC depending on what the level is. Yeah. So with this round of discussion, still it is inconclusive whether you know uh, to treat the male uh, or to you know maybe the counsel the counsel the patient. Uh, so uh, I feel that you cannot treat anybody in isolation. Like Dr. Rahul Reddy also said that if there is no time to treat the male, then you have to treat the sperm. You have to follow the best lab practices, right. and you have to avoid any kind of iatrogenic DNA damage. maybe even process at room temperature keep the stage of during sperm selection if it's a poor sample so those okay. things can be instituted in your in your facility but other than that wiser is to treat the male patients are also like uh, uh, it's a fast food culture you know patients also want instant results they don't like to wait for a couple of months before starting the ivf cycle and sometimes you know there are international patients who can't who can't stay in your country for a, a two three months you know It, it adds to the cost also. So, so you mean to say, if, even if the uh, no cause is treatable, you would like to skip the treatment for this? No, no. What I'm saying is treat the cause. Okay. Treat the cause. Treat the treat the male, not the sperm. When um, okay. when somebody is having some fever due to pneumonia, we are not only treating the fever; we are also treating the pneumonia. Right. So. the sub question with this is suppose a patient with high dfi has a great varicocele on the left side and a grade 1 on the right side so what treatment do you prefer and why i think dr chirag or dr rahul that you can take this question obviously we'll uh, suggest varicocele surgery microscopic <laughs> microsurgical varicocele like so, so what, what do you suggest sir like bilateral or bilateral it should be it should be bilateral but still it is on the grade 1 no see what happens is you don't know when it progresses from grade 1 to grade 2 it tends so to go you correct. go one side after 3 months you will come back with a second report saying that right side it is grade 2 you can't operate again and there are studies proving that uh, uh, both sides operating uh, operations are having better results than uh, uh, the larger I mean, side yes so what about the <laughs> reasons for this uh, dna damage as already our panelist has mentioned and uh, the most important thing is you have to evaluate the levels of dna damage and uh, this is a small study oops uh, the bar graph is missing here but anyways so uh, in the study where they were done a meta analysis of 16 studies and uh, 2 9 16 couples were involved in this and there was increased miscarriage rate in couple undergoing ivf or icc where there, there is a high sperm dna damage The risk ratio is 2.16 and uh, 95% confidence interval. So, as uh, no rightly mentioned, the no there is another study where it showed a very uh, promising results with no when the patients are treated with varicocele prior to ICSI. So, there is an improvement in the fertilization rate as well as LBR, live birth rate, and also there is a reduction in the miscarriage rates. So, coming to the uh, question five. So, do you advise any medical treatment before microtesi? And if yes, please elaborate. So it depends why uh, the patient is having the condition. Probably we are ha- facing a patient who is having uh, azoospermia, and uh, um, we are going to perform a microtesi over it to for uh, the processor of ICSI. um if the patient is having some hormonal report showing low low condition that means uh, he is having um, low lhfsh plus uh, 
less than 200 uh, uh, say total testosterone in that condition definitely we should uh, give some um, treatment in the form of uh, gonadotropins or uh, uh, clomiphene like that or if there is any you know skewing of uh, um, t ratio then we can provide some anestrozol um otherwise uh, empirical use of gonadotropins or uh, um, antioxidants usually do not work rahul sir would you like to add anything to this oh, yes uh, dr sigal said see there is no role of empirical uh, gonadotropins but if a patient has very low testosterone very low testosterone lh is very high then at least try to increase intratestricular testosterone levels they, these conditions are generally i'll add hcg for 4 uh, to 8 weeks then see we here what we are doing uh, doing is we can't produce new sperm but what we are trying to uh, deal is spermiogenesis part so spermiogenesis takes around 20 uh, 20 to 24 days so during that period if you can give him enough testosterone support the testosterone means i'm not saying about uh, direct testosterone it is hcg uh, then most of the patients will improve you get a better quality sperm uh, then uh, patient where he hasn't taken uh, hcg injections but if testosterone is normal then there is no need for uh, hcg injections you can straight away go for uh, micro tc okay so with that note there is a case scenario uh, no uh, which is a hypothetical case scenario where the patient has been posted for micro tc so these are the uh, uh, findings the volume is 3 ml fructose is positive and the uh, fsh is 33 lh is 23 testosterone 3.8 and uh, e2 is 25 and uh, normal karyotype and no y chromosome microdeletions and testis size is normal with no varicocele so this patient has been pulled and this couple underwent micro tc and the sperms were obtained and the xc was performed and ended up with co blastocyst so fresh transfer was not done due to the risk of ohss and the fate was performed in two subsequent cycles so both fetuses ended up in failure so what may be the reason as you mentioned that lady has a ohss so uh, first we have to rule out that uh, though it no, is a it was uh, like uh, cancelled in the fresh like there was no fresh transfer it was done in the subsequent cycle true, where the plant for true but here you didn't mention uh, the failure is due to a female partner because that could be multiple reason on the female counterpart so if it is constant then there is we should think about the male part but here you didn't mention that uh, female is having the issue or not whether so she let has let a us, let us imagine ma female is like normal like you no know, whatever the parameters we have checked for everything looks normal absolutely mm-hmm. normal though no, mm-hmm. it was like clear cut male factor mm-hmm. in the scenarios like how could you take this like what could be a reason for probable reason for you no know, the failure then there will be implant just you know because it uh, the if it is a sperm issue uh, it that it has developed till blastocyst it has not arrested at uh, you know cleavage stage or something so that uh, sperm issue uh, is also not there then there should be uh, any kind of idiopathic implantation failure okay. because if you just day 3 it is it has gone to till blastocysts yeah correct correct yes uh, go back to the previous slide can you go back to the previous slide uh, with the semen parameter yeah yeah so these are the values Do you like to recommend any other extra test or parameter that has to be checked before, you know, proceeding with the micro testing here? I will always mention volume of the testes. Volume of the testes. Okay. Even even uh, the quality of sperms retrieved. What uh, mm-hmm. quality of sperms were retrieved? Were they intact enough? Were they showing any kind of motility or uh, any kind of morphology defect? Were there those uh, things? No, I'm coming there. I'm coming there. There is the. Uh-huh. I just queued up in the next line. I'll we'll just yeah, address yeah. that. Okay. 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 
so uh, how do you counsel them and uh, no what like well, with all this no would you advise to repeat the micro tc uh, go for a pgt cycle uh, uh, if the cycles if it two fpt cycles have failed so it okay. makes sense to go for a pgt and look because uh, okay. sperm maybe you know the impurities may be coming from the sperm so that okay. can be one, one aspect so that can be ruled out when you are going for pgt okay Yes, sure. we used to free uh, we used to freeze uh, sperms in our lab whether it is uh, we created embryos or not after ICSI we have a protocol of freezing all uh, TISA sample so we separate these uh, sperms and we freeze this pellet and uh, tissue in separate vials so okay. in case in, let's say your case if it is failed cycle already and if it is female cell is normal as uh, Sarbhita has mentioned. We can go ahead with uh, that frozen thawed teaser sample, and we can use theophylline kind of uh, sperm activators to if there is no motility and all. And, yeah, uh, I've just come there. And as uh, PGTA, I think would be the option for implantation failure. And uh, I would go with single embryo transfer in this case. I don't waste the embryos as two two. I would go with PGTA normal embryo with single embryo transfer. well thank you and uh, now like to ask dr shweta to you no know, take it for take, take over the session uh, sanket can can i interfere yeah yeah please sir <laughs> so there are two things one uh, uh, dr charulata also wanted to point out because you mentioned about ohss hmm so right sir yeah so uh, there is no mention how many eggs you retrieved hmm so if it was because of that and you did not transfer in the fresh cycle so there should be some reason why there was a risk of ohss might be the female partner is having some hormonal imbalance that continues for a, a long period of time when you transfer in the uh, uh, natural cycle or modified cycle in, in fets that is one thing another thing is uh, something may be wrong with your freezing itself mm -hmm. with so, the cryo preservation okay yes so the the quality of uh, because you are freezing blastocysts so there is no way that you can find out whether those blastocysts are good enough to be implanted looking at just just the morphology you cannot predict that and it's just the uh, four blastocysts so i wonder if the patient is lending up into OHSs, there must be many more eggs. Harvest is more. Yes. Okay. So why just four blastocysts? So all these things should be considered. Needs to be considered. Yeah. Mm. Before you counsel the patient for the next cycle. That's right. 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 Shweta, ma'am. Okay, so just moving on. Uh, so my cases are more clinical, more than embryological. So this is... Uh, a 31 year old male married since four years and couple comes seeking for uh, treatment for fertility. The partner's age is 28 years and there were about three to four uh, semen analysis report and volume was two ml. Uh, there were no sperm seen even after centrifugation and fructose is positive. Now, since this panel is on uh, treating male or treating sperm, so Further investigating, uh, the person said that uh, shaving pattern is about two to three times in, say, 15 days. His height is 170 centimeters, 70 kg, with a BMI of 24.5. And then when he, uh, you know, the investigations are done, which uh, very rightly I just heard, the two hormones, and that is it. So FSH and LH, it was 0 0.4, 0 0.3 LH, and total testosterone of 200. So my... Uh, Following questions are that, uh, what is the diagnosis? Uh, maybe we can have Dr. Rahul and Dr. Chirag to start with, and anyone can put in their views. Uh, in this particular case, once you have diagnosed, would you like to do some special test? Uh, is there any role of genetic counseling in this couple? Uh, and then how to go about it? So let's answer the first three questions first. So uh, what is the diagnosis? This patient is showing a picture of uh, azospermia uh, with uh, low FSH LH and uh, testosterone. So hypogonadotropic hypogonadism secondary prime, uh, testicular failure kind of picture is there. 
so um what is the special test there is no special test actually if the patient is having some um, um uh, intracranial symptoms of uh, uh, you know tubular vision or something like that pituitary issues then we can go ahead for mri but uh, otherwise i usually do not if prolactin is high or you know very high kind of okay. microadenoma uh, you mm-hmm. know uh, so in that scene we can do you offer a genetic counseling uh, no because he is having secondary um, testicular failure sir you want to take next two okay. yeah as you said uh, dr chira uh, i had a similar case where i thought it's a case of uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism after 2 uh, 3 months then uh, i checked this prolactin level yeah prolactin was almost 234 yeah so so before starting treatment in these cases uh, better to check prolactin 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 is high then we have to treat it as hyperprolactinemia if prolactin is normal then we have to treat it like hypogonadotropic hypogonadism these patients will improve but oh, oh, that uh, diagn- uh, the improvement depends on testicular size if their testicular size is good then we can put them on uh, gonadotropins but if testicular size is too small then it's uh, uh, according to my experience result, my, my my results are very poor even after 3 uh, to 6 months of gonadotropins it takes uh, actually um, what it takes years together yes. actually yes uh, so so important thing is that uh, uh, both the neurologists they are agreeing that medical treatment is the first to be offered if we are thinking of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and i think possibly this is one of the only cases in male infertility which will give the most promising results if the right medical treatment is administered to them uh, so uh, basically what is the age madam uh, what is their uh, what is the... so they are in late 20s then yeah okay okay so my uh, thing is of course as uh, you know dr chirag said that we actually don't go about doing any genetic testing when it comes to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism vis-a-vis when we are looking at a non obstructive azospermia where we are thinking of klein filter or we could be thinking of a y micro deletion but here i think it was more of an academic purpose and the second thought process was that if he has some kind of visual symptoms or signs or symptoms of hyperprolactinemia then we go about doing an mri and that also would be a contrast mri because otherwise it may not be able to pick it up so now my question is that uh, when do you kind of uh, start the therapeutic intervention because you could be having these uh, boys coming at very young age could be in the uh, adolescent age first time getting diagnosed and could be coming right at the time of fertility most of them may be picked up because of certain growth issues so just wanted your views that when we are dealing with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism how do we uh, approach these boys right from the beginning actually uh, these uh, boys usually start treatment when they are uh, in their uh, um, teens actually uh, they mm-hmm. are 15 16 because the um, beard is not uh, there and uh, they feel that uh, they are uh, not like their uh, colleagues so during that time what happens they go to a physician then they are referred to a endocrinologist and uh, endocrinologist starts a testosterone usually uh, whatever testosterone they use and then starts uh, th- then uh, actually the problem starts because this testosterone has a feedback inhibition towards these things that beard and uh, uh, the secondary sexual characters will come but uh, uh, when this patient comes to you that time he has either not stopped that or just have stopped that at that time we have to reverse the cycle no we have yes. to reverse the cycle now testosterone has to be stopped and gonadotropin has to be started Correct. but this reversal takes time it, it it takes years it takes years to reverse so what what the, uh, what is what the new new theory or what uh, i think is um, whether we should start um, mm, gonadotropins even earlier when they are planning for marriage you know mm-hmm. this will save time because ultimately they will they will need fertility and they cannot achieve it naturally 
with this size of testes with this count of sperms so we should start gonadotrophins even before they are going to marry because after 6 months or 1 year they will try to have pregnancy so we should start it early so uh, dr chirag when you are putting uh, these boys what is do you come across these side effects i mean when they are on testosterone because i remember there was a patient of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism male who came to my opd and he said every time i am taking hcg for a long time i start having gynecomastia and it was a very disturbing symptom for him and he would just stop it and he refused to take it any further so uh, do you come across or while on testosterone is there any recommendation to monitor them look testosterone comes with many complication uh, many side effects and uh, we should monitor them first of all your lf uh, the patient's lft and um, uh, this uh, polygynemia cbc for polygynemia and these things should be monitored okay what about uh, your view dr rahul if you have something to add to it Uh, practically what is the testosterone you all are giving to these young boys which form in india we have only in uh, we, we have only two farms uh, yeah. undefinite uh, one is available in 250 mg and another is in 1000 mg uh, even 100 mg is available in india okay But for these people uh, if if a uh, patient comes in pre puberty age group uh, that is before 14 years Hundred milligrams is more than enough. If their body weight is less than forty kilos, if okay. their body weight body weight is more than forty uh, kilos, then they need two fifty milligrams. Only thing what we have to see is the testosterone level should not go to supra normal levels. If the testosterone level is in the lower side, just bring it to normal range. If you give high dose testosterone, because we have seen uh, boys taking weekly testosterone injections, which mm-hmm. Uh, which will take them to supra normal levels which is not good and second thing whenever you are giving testosterone you have to monitor te ratios okay so te ratio the when there is abnormal te ratio then gynecomastia will set okay so and when again te ratio is on the higher side even normal males when uh, adult males if you are giving testosterone if they are obese then fat converts it into estrogen so abnormal aromatization is there so you have to stop that either add uh, uh, if the st ratio is abnormal just add either anastrozole or letrozole uh, uh, once in uh, once in two days or once in three days along with hcg therapy or testosterone okay That's so as, yeah so as dr chirag and dr rahul very nicely summed it up that you start with testosterone in the form of a gel or make the ratio just at the normal level but not at a very supra physiological level and then dr chirag said that if of course the marriage is absolutely defined then we can maybe start a gonadotropins at the time when he would be looking at fertility in future because spermatogenesis will be achieved but it will take time and it could be even one year it could be even two years and uh, i think the best way to monitor uh, the response when we are giving only hcg is testosterone levels if they are rising yes maybe the spermatogenesis can be achieved only with hcg however if the uh, testosterone levels are not rising then most of them would require a combination of hmg along with maybe a small dose of hcg twice weekly thrice weekly and a poorer results if the child had undescended tes- testes uh, and of course better results which dr rahul had earlier said that testicular volume is a very very important parameter to know the success now very quick question to all the embryologists I know that one case I dealt with. He's a case of thalassemia major survivor, and he has landed up with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism for years together. He was taking uh, HMG and HCG. He underwent one IVF because, despite all the treatment, the sperm count was something like one to two sperm per high mot- high power mot- uh, fields. And so we did an ICSI. Wife only had four oocytes, made two embryos, got pregnant, has a child. Now. when we are dealing with these kind of patients would you like to freeze the samples and keep so uh, i could have input from anyone dr sarapreet or dr charulata dr rahul yeah dr. Def- definitely with advances in a semen freezing technique like a sperm vitrification <clears throat> and uh, some devices are also helpful to freeze or to vitrify such kind of very small numbers of spermatozoa 
so that it can be used like for this kind of couple she the lady is lucky that she conceived in two embryos but if it is yeah. a full cycle or something we need a sperm for the subsequent cycles so it is better to freeze what how many uh, sperms we retrieved in the first ivf attempt only so uh, this case is the azospermia for my practice even for uh, you know cryptozospermia or something whenever the tz or micro tz is done i freeze the sample i counsel the patient in such a way that uh, you know patient should uh, agree to freeze the semen sample so that so was there used. any minimum number of vials would you think because i'll tell you what happened this person called me 3 days back that he says now i want to have a second child and at facility 1 where he had frozen for last 2 years he had not renewed his semen sample and i think it was discarded unfortunately you know. doctor for initially yeah. we initially we used to freeze such kind of sample in the vials but now uh, the vitrification technique we use a device uh, called uh, uh, oh, cell yeah. sleeper and or else we can directly you know make a globulate with the 0.5% of sucrose so that is the minimum volume what we can freeze so uh, we can take one device or we can take a few goblets so if you take a one vial and if you do not have any other backup vial then it's a problem but if you freeze in such kind of goblets with the vitrification technique you can retrieve few goblets and few sperm yeah because this was done 4 years back so yes. possibly that time we didn't and now the but the better part is that he has still one sperm frozen in some other city which he would be transporting because he stopped gonadotropin after his first child so in order to achieve that spermatogenesis would again take him 2 years but maybe his wife you know now was could be having a poorer ovarian reserve than before so we don't know so we're just moving on to the second case that uh, This patient is a 35 year old patient. Wife is 31 years. Secondary infertility of four years. History of recurrent urinary tract infection, and semen analysis shows a 4 ml volume semen, a count of 35 million with motility of only 10 percent, 4 percent normal morphology, but the round cells were 8 to 10 per high power field, and the leukocyte esterase test is positive. now uh, my question is that uh, i wonder that how many centers even are doing the peroxidase i mean test uh, it's very important i think so what's your diagnosis and uh, how will you proceed i think again the enroll i mean dr chirag and dr rahul can come in and uh, then we can have the lab perspective to later on uh, i generally go ahead with semen culture in these cases because doing a semen culture uh, uh, is easier than doing a peroxidase test because you need a trained technician and most mm -hmm. of the diagnostic centers most of the diagnostic centers won't do. at least if you have a good ivf center if you have your own technician then uh, do a peroxidase test then okay. you can So, uh, when you uh, go about looking at uh, urinary tract infection, is there anything specific you are looking at? Because this is one field which I think is very uh, undertreated or underdiagnosed too. So, is it more commonly you find urethritis or balanitis, or or is it prostatitis? Because I think prostatitis is like the most difficult one to treat. So, what are we actually treating? what we are commonly seeing is either seminal vasculitis or prostatitis okay and it's a, it's a single system once there is seminal vasculitis obviously you will have epididymitis you will see inflammation if you do a ultrasound uh, you will see inflammation in the epididymis okay so in males mostly it is prostatitis or seminal vasculitis yes dr chirag what was yes. these are uh, all all uh, most of the times are low grade infections chronic infections and uh, uh, on examination of course um, if we are not doing a tre definitely epididymis and uh, uh, cord will suggest there is some tenderness there is some bulkiness there is some funiculitis okay some something which is uh, bulky cord is bulky even when there is no varicose when you examine for varicose there is no varicose but still the cord is bulky so uh, and these uh, these infections can be classified by either uh, 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 organ based or organism based so uh, it, whether it is an epididymitis or 
uh, funiculitis or uh, seminal vesiculitis, prostatitis, urethritis, and uh, which organism is there. So if you are doing a culture, then what, uh, what type of organism you are finding? Uh, is it, um, you know, uh, a PCR report, you know, for uh, uh, chlamydia or uh, um, organisms which cannot be grown in culture easily? So it depends like that. So once uh, a diagnosis of leukocytospermia has been established, what is the minimum duration uh, when you would like to give an antibiotic? And suppose this male partner was heading towards, the couple was heading towards an IVF cycle, then what is the time duration or how would you like them to proceed? So it depends uh, on the orga organ which is involved. If it is a prostate which is involved, it takes a uh, couple of months to treat actually. Um, mm -hmm. like uh, say two months, uh, six weeks to two months uh, treatment is required for uh, treating a prostate uh, infection, low-grade prostate infection. Uh, and or, uh, this drug will depend upon what organism which is involved and uh, duration depends on what organ is involved. We'll say if it is a seminal vesiculitis, four weeks treatment will, uh, will help us. Uh, similarly, if urethritis is there, even lower amount and epididymis is even lower amount. So like this, uh, we can treat these patients. Okay. So we'll just move on that, yes, peroxidase positive cells, if we have these uh, quick slides now available and uh, the more, uh, I mean, this can be checked. Any count more than 1 million is called significant. So we can easily find out not all round cells are uh, pus cells. So we need to distinguish the round cells from the real RBCs and should not be labeling uh, semen unnecessarily. Of course, antibiotics. What about antioxidants and NACIDs? Would you like to give that? Actually, bacteriospermia and uh, leukocytospermia are two different entities. Yeah. And uh, we cannot uh, say these are uh, uh, totally proportional to each other. Sometimes there is leukocytospermia, but bacteriospermia is not there. So um, we can um, uh, say that this le leukocytospermia is because of some you know, inflammatory condition which is going over there, maybe heavy smoking or some uh, heat exposure during his uh, daily work. So for that, definitely antibiotics will not going to work. And uh, we have to take support of uh, these NSAIDs and antioxidants. Uh, Dr. Rahul, do you also practice... Uh... In the similar fashion, what uh, Dr. Chirag just said, that if he doesn't find any bacterial cultures positive, then he would like to give NSEIDs and antioxidants. But if there are positive bacterial cultures, and then we go ahead with antibiotics. Yeah, same thing. But only thing is, uh, these patients, they need long-term low-dose antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics yes. should be at least for three to four weeks uh, before you uh, repeat the test. And along with antibiotics, they need uh, anti-inflammatory. Okay. So, uh, so that's a very important point that number one, a longer duration of antibiotics, do not jump to ART cycles or any treatment very prematurely. Uh, you, there will be a limited role of antioxidants and NSEIDs when we are looking at leukocytospermia. So just a case for uh, the embryology side. So couple the tubal block in female partner taken for IVF, semen culture was done. It showed E. coli grown and man was treated with appropriate antibiotics for two weeks. Repeat culture was sterile and was immediately taken for IVF. So of course the culture was done uh, because possibly the, the round cells were being seen. But on day two, the culture dishes were observed to have a growth neck. So what do the embryologists, how do they go about it? Uh, we can ask Dr. Sarapreet's uh, opinion that on the day, suppose, of uh, the oocyte retrieval, we see a semen sample which starts showing, you know, a lot of round cells. And how would you go about it? In such cases, Dr. Shweta, we should go for a double density uh, sperm filtration followed by ICSI to minimize the chances of uh, infection in, in dishes, you know, on day two or day three. But now that these dishes have infection, probably, you know, they were taken for IVF. Uh, that was a reason, uh, probably, you know, the infection came from the seminal, uh, uh, from the semen. So I think the right, correct approach should have been uh, a cautious ICSI rather than going for IVF in such a case. Okay. Dr. Charulata, do you have something to add? And how often have you seen this happening, you know, in the culture systems? 
No, generally the couple who is undergoing with us uh, will have a previous analysis done. And yes. if we found that any round cells or something which is more than the normal, definitely that uh, man will undergo culture and sensitivity. So that first thing is done. And as in this case also, it has been done. So uh, for any such case, it is always been uh, ICSI. Uh, as Saraprit has very correctly said, double density, and even after the ICSI, we uh, wash that oocyte twice into the culture medium before mm -hmm. transferring into the post-ICSI dish. So that uh, anything has to be ruled out. And generally, if it is, you know, time lapse or study or something for such kind of cases, it is better to have a look on the next day, a day one, when we check the fer fertilization. Dr. Samshi, how often do you come across uh, a situation like this? or uh, are we able to very nicely overcome this situation in our labs? Uh, it is very, very rare situation which I come across. Um, in case, I think they have mentioned already that we have, we have to go with double density gradient. Uh, but I think um, culture dishes contaminated, you can do a, you know, fresh, you can just change over with the fresh media, but still, and uh, uh, it is very less possibility that culture will, will and not... And doc, uh, Dr. Shweta, I would like to yeah. mention that uh, yeah. if there is any other pickup with that particular case, whether that dishes are clear or not. So whether it is the contamination comes from the improper handling of the embryologist or anything can also be ruled out. So I remember that in so many years, there was only one case in our lab. I mean, two in last 16 years, I can recall. And off lately, one dish showed a culture, which we sent to the microbiology department. And the report came something which was very funny to hear. It was called loafer bacteria. And then the, our microbiologist said that, no, this is just a very freak incidence. And go ahead and do this embryo transfer. And we did that embryo transfer and it resulted in a clinical pregnancy rate. So I think finding out that what is the growth which is being seen is also very important. And yeah, a tie yeah. up with a good microbiology department. Dr. Rahul, yeah. what did mm -hmm. you all say on, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Dr. Rahul said, embryologist. <laughs> so from his point of view, just for the clinicians or for all of us, what are your take when, uh, what are the precautions I, you can say or the robust steps to yeah, prevent yeah. this event in the lab? Yes, uh, on to the precautionary side, like everyone has clearly mentioned that uh, undergoing uh, with uh, density gradient preparation and uh, clearly uh, selecting the single sperms and doing ICSI, that is, uh, yes, uh, can be the precautionary step. But again, uh, what I basically see and I basically practice is if it is already seen that there is an infection in a ejaculate, what we do is on the day of uh, collection, we add a culture media in that. So to reduce uh, the chances of uh, this leukocytes coming or uh, separating during this, uh, proce uh, this preparation method. And uh, if the contamination has already been seen, what uh, is being said is there is one study that uh, they have mentioned the use of serial dilutions serial dilutions and doing culture, uh, again, uh, culturing these embryos that can reduce the chances of uh, spreading that infection. Yes, thank you. So I think what the evidence says is that if the dishes were contaminated with yeast, it had even worse outcome as compared to when there were bacterial infections. And I think uh, unanimously our medias contain gentamicin, if I'm not wrong, uh, and which was vis-a-vis -vis over penicillin and streptomycin, which was earlier, and applying ICSI procedure in such particular case is the answer, even when we are thinking, like, say, for tubal factor or something, but ICSI would be better if you're seeing a lot of round cells. Uh, I'll just wind up in two minutes more. Uh, so I think my questions are, again, more towards the andrology side. A 28-year-old person, married since two years, or IT guy. Semen analysis shows, uh, of course, 10 million count with the progressive mortality of 25%, morphology 5% fru uh, normal fructose positive. Now here his BMI is 31.1. So now my question was that if we are dealing with such uh, you know, obese men with this kind of a report, 
and a 28 year old you know couple so should we advise them ivf straight on or do you think medical treatment can help him if no other cause is found out why ivf doctor we can always wait we can always wait we can see when there is increased testicular temperature definitely their dna fragmentation will be on the higher side but these patients they need hormonal workup uh correct their te ratio since he is on the overweight his bmi yeah. and bmi on the higher side if te ratio is abnormal correct them and take them for iui yes so when te ratio is abnormal uh, could you just tell us that how do you calculate this te ratio and, and what kind of drug do you advise them uh, when we are dealing with oligo astheno which we think is purely because of no other explainable reason but obesity yeah. te ratio when te ratio test, uh, testosterone to estrogen ratio should be uh, 10 no? less than 10 yeah. suppose if testosterone is around uh, 4.2 nanograms per uh, mil and uh, if estrogen is more than 40 then it's obviously on the higher side though the, the semen uh, the parameters clinical parameter reference ranges are normal if most of the labs they give e2 parameters has uh, 20 to 60 so in spite of uh, having in uh, having these parameters in normal range we have to calculate te ratio so, Dr. Rahul, what is your drug of choice for such men? Is it letrozole, anastrozole? Do we get anastrozole in India easily or no. do we resort to letrozole? Uh, I use both. Though. Previously, okay. I used to use anastrozole. Yeah. Now, I am using letrozole. So, for how long do you use letrozole and what is the dose you are giving at? Uh, it, it depends on the, uh, the TE ratio, doctor. I start uh, once in three days. Uh, every three days, one tablet uh, okay. in the morning. If uh, the ratio is still abnormal, then I start uh, alternate days. Okay. But if a uh, morbid obese uh, patient with abnormal T ratio, where uh, T ratio is 1 is 40, then uh, I give uh, daily doses of letrozole. And for how long? And when is the time when you would like to stop letrozole? Does it affect the bone density even in men when we yes, are giving? That is, why, that is why you are not supposed to give it as daily doses. There are so many. Yeah. Uh, side effects and most of these patients with uh, come back with low libido in spite of having high testosterone levels they'll they'll say there is low libido this is the commonest clinical yes. side effect what we are seeing so once you reach normal te ratio then you have to cut down your letrozole or anastrozole only for maintenance purposes. then what i do is i give weekly one staff okay weekly that's once. very yeah Dr. Chikad, do you want to put in uh, some more input on this? So, T ratio is calculated by uh, testosterone measuring in nanogram per TL uh, on estradiol in picogram per ml. Yeah. So, uh, with this uh, ratio, uh, if it is more than 10, um, then we have to uh, uh, do not intervene in some anything because testosterone is normal, uh, testosterone is on the higher side. But if it is less than 10, then I do use um, an estrozole and uh, it is one gram. Uh, mostly I use daily and um, so far it is uh, okay with me. Most of uh, patients are, you know, um, are obese and uh, these patients uh, do increase with their uh, um, uh, sperm count and uh, there are good results with it. Yes. Thank you so much. So, uh, yes, uh, aromatase inhibitors, they have their role, especially in unexplained oligoastheno in obese men with an altered TE ratio. And it's important to start doing them and to give the right dose for the right duration. And then possibly how Dr. Rahul said that they will not need most of the times maybe entering into an ART cycle and could be having a natural conception or into an IUI cycle would be achieving the results. So uh, I think, uh, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Dr. Sanket. It's important to treat the male first without any doubt, have the cause established, come to the right diagnosis, have a plan made out. I think main, uh, males should not be ignored. We give a lot of importance to female infertility and I think male infertility needs equal importance. So Dr. Sanket, now you can maybe wind up. 
thank you so much thank you so much ma'am and uh, once again thank you all for having you know sharing your opinion with us and you no know, uh, shedding light on this uh, very interesting topic na to treat the male or to treat the sperm now i would like to hand it over to dr akash thank you dr sanket dr shweta dr rahul dr charu dr samshehari dr rahul sen uh, dr chira gupta thank you so much uh, it was a really wonderful session you know we always think that male infertility uh, earlier when i started practice kya karna hai bas ek si hai sperm hai ek si kar do but it has been evolving and uh, the males have been getting the due credit in process of time i guess and uh, like rightly it has been highlighted to the panel that it is the male who has to be treated first followed by treatment here of the sperm and we have seen some wonderful lectures at the beginning of the talk uh, about the analysis we have seen about the history examination part the treatment part was very well covered in the panel and about the automated semen analysis as well so i would thank each and everyone and like to invite dr wait sir so at the end i would like to thank all of you for making this event very successful and uh, as rightly said by akash that first to treat male and after that uh, sperm but sometimes situation is like that this uh, if patient is coming at at the time of uh, treatment for ivf then what to do so at the time we have only that option to go for tisa something like that of thing and maybe treat the sperm first so uh, it was very wonderful topics uh, we uh, selected for today's talk uh, event and i would like to thank all of you or the panelist moderator and the speakers to making it successful and of course adbi for organizing this program for us thank you so much thank you everyone thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you thank you bye you. everyone thank bye you. bye uh, 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 karan uh, if you want to say something please come yes yeah. yeah thank you sir on behalf of team adbi i would like to thank our esteemed speakers panelists moderators for sharing their enriching talk and scientific content and a special thanks to team ahera for their support in making this event a success last but not the least our delegates without whom the session uh, any webinar and conference is incomplete thank you all for making it a success wish you all a very good night stay safe stay healthy thank you thank you, thank you. bye everyone bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. take bye. care